Hello, Thrivers, and welcome back to the Freedom Portal. We have a doozy in store for you today. The topic is esoteric insights inform cutting edge technology, tying it all together with Robert Grant, a modern day da Vinci. So imagine, like I've been imagining recently, imagine your kind of ideal panel in the Freedom Portal. Imagine if we could have Leonardo da Vinci, Indiana Jones, Walter Russell, Steve Jobs, Satoshi Yakamoto, and let's throw in Ward Cleaver all on the show together. Well, that's what we've got today. We'll be talking with the many facets of the remarkable Robert E. Grant. So Robert is uh, featured in Thrive 2. Uh, he's an action-oriented entrepreneur who's been accessing unprecedented insights into the structure and process patterns of the cosmos, and then grounding the principles that get revealed in breakthrough technologies for encryption, data sovereignty, and much more. Robert is the founder, chairman, and managing partner of Strathsby Crown LLC, a growth equity company based in Newport Beach, California, with a broad portfolio of company and asset holdings spanning healthcare, clean energy, social media, and financial technology. His other interests include number theory, mathematical physics, geometry, cryptography, and blockchain currency. And most importantly, according to Robert, who seems to have his priorities pretty straight, he's a loving husband and father to two wonderful daughters. So welcome, Robert. Join us, please. Turn your camera. Hi, on. Foster. <laughs> it's really great to see you again. Thanks so it's... much for coming on on a weekend. First of all, I know how important that is to your family. So thanks to your whole family for for the loan for a couple hours here. And also, I understand that it that you had your uh, company holiday party last night, and yes. that's tradition. That's traditionally uh, quite an event. So. The fact that you've dragged yourself in here, if you're only thinking at Mach 6 today, we'll understand. <laughs> so well, how are yeah, you doing, we had, a, we had a great We had a great night last night. We had a big celebration. We had some really big news this uh, this last week in one of one of our companies. So it was uh, it was definitely, you know, our Christmas parties are pretty, pretty well known. Um, and we definitely have a great time. It's always important to celebrate, particularly you know, whether you've had a challenging year or you've had a very successful year or both, uh, I think <laughs> you know, celebrating success is such an important thing and, and also celebrating togetherness, especially at this time of year. Well, thank you so much for coming on and welcome to all of the people, our regular subscribers, plus the large groups on the public platforms. We're streaming on Rumble, Odyssey, Rockfin, Telegram, Facebook. I understand that Robert is also streaming out on Instagram. So we're, we're getting the word out there on this conversation today. And uh, Robert, I know you like a challenge <laughs> and you're an expert in compression. Mm -hmm. So our task today is to compress the entire cosmos and the whole sweep of history into about an hour and a half and then have some Q&A at the end of that. So, okay. uh, so everybody fasten your seatbelts because, uh, you know, Listening to one comprehensivist is challenging enough, and your subscribers are doing that with me all the time. You bring two together, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's going to be a, uh, an epic opportunity. I I've really been excited about this conversation. Me so, too. Me too. In addition to all the knowledge that we're going to explore, um, I really like to get personal on these shows because people know figures like you as public figures and the things you've done and the things you know and so forth. But I also like to, to give people a kind of a glimpse behind the curtain into your life. You know, you said a thing, an interesting thing on a call recently. I heard you say, uh, we each have our own encryption to decrypt and discover mm. who we truly are. And boy, mm. that really, really resonated with me. So I want to start right at the core of everything and ask you, what is your purpose in life these days? Well, you know, I... <laughs> I I think it's something that I have, it's probably always been the same, but my understanding of it has evolved. And in particular, in the last few years, I think it's dramatically evolved. You know, I was living life and, and living in this sort of 3D 
world, I guess, 3D, 4D world, if you include the time matrix of it. And I've always been fascinated by, you know, the notion of what time is and our experience with it. And I came to the conclusion several years ago that, you know, our comprehension of time is directly tied to our experience with it. So I realized that when I was younger, one year seemed like a really long time. And as you get older, one year goes by really fast. And I realized, well, if I'm only one year old, one year is a whole lifetime. And if I'm 50 <laughs> years old, it's only one fiftieth. So it definitely seems to go by faster. But I think, you know, I was kind of living life and I had probably a very lucky and successful career. And at, su- at a certain stage, I started feeling like I was a bit on a hamster trail. You know, I had a big crisis in 2016. I've talked to you about this before. And I, I felt and experienced betrayal in a major way. And it really broke me and it turned me into kind of a hermit for about a year and a half, two years. But out of that was one of the most beautiful things because I ended up becoming a sculptor. I ended up going deep into mathematics. I had to reconstruct what was the objective reality I was living because so many people had done things that I was just shocked by. I couldn't believe it. And and I realized then that that maybe my purpose to come here to this experience in life was to learn through the opposites of what I wanted to learn. Hmm. So what do I mean by learning through the opposites? Well, in order for us to understand pleasure, you have to also have the contextual reference of experiencing pain. Hmm. And if we are here to learn unconditional love, then we have to learn through conditional love. And what is conditional love but betrayal? And so these are the things that I believe I chose to experience. And I ultimately feel now that my purpose for being here is to, after all the complexity and all the challenge and all the accomplishment and all the failure, is to actually just learn how to love and and how to be loved. Huh. Yeah, let that sink in, folks, with all of the accomplishment, with all the incredible activities and opportunities that this guy has. For him also, <laughs> it comes back to love, you know, and that may be a partial answer to where I, what I wanted to ask you next, because my experience of you, and I've gotten the blessing to be around you a bunch and then watch a ton of video and go with you both physically and then virtually again to, to Egypt. And what I notice is an incredible quality of enthusiasm. And, you know, enthusiasm comes from entheos, you know, in, 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 in God. And you're the energy and the curiosity that you seem to have and the ability that you have to multitask, to get along with a lot of people. You know, you're hugely generous with your time and your resources and your expertise. And you are, like I mentioned, a comprehensivist. You're really covering everything. So um, what's the key for you when other people are, are lacking it and looking for, what's the key for you to being in that enthusiasm? You know, I think I've always had this zeal for life. I mean, I'm one of these people that literally wakes up just about every day and feels like I'm so happy. <laughs> and, and I remember like um, people my whole life would be like, so why are you so happy? What's going on? <laughs> and I mean, even I, I can't even remember a time where I didn't have that aspect, I suppose. Even when I was going through that period of of, you know, being a hermit and sort of asking myself the deeper questions and and reconstructing my objective reality, both mathematically, geometrically, and through art. Um, even that, I was still, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd still be excited about greeting the day. Yeah. I was just sort of like, I needed a timeout period to kind of figure out what the heck just happened. You know, it's, I went through this situation in 2016 where I took the... It, I had a, a unicorn company that took off very quickly. And then uh, the VCs tried to, you know, one of the VCs in particular really tried to steal the company out from underneath me. And in the process, went at a lot of people that were my friends and colleagues for many, many years, decades, in fact, and uh, and and turned some of them against me because it was going to be financially in their favor to, to do that. Yeah, And I thought for sure that they had me dead to right. So I was not going to be able to survive it. I had to raise $55 million in one day. (laughs) 
<laughs> in one day. And I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to do this to maintain, you know, and, and be able to keep my company. And so I almost lost it all. And actually at the very last second, somehow I pulled a rabbit out and, and I don't know where the rabbit came from, but definitely from my backside. And I could say <laughs> that, uh, you know, all of a sudden it came together by like total miracle. And at that point, a lot of people had already like counted me out. Right. And they didn't expect it. And then the whole game flipped right in the very last seconds. And here I was with a, a victory, but I felt like it was a failure. And this is what's referred to in history as a Pyrrhic victory. It's like where, where you win, but at the same time, it's actually a loss. And so I felt this, this deep loss because these, some of these people and, you know, it wasn't everyone, but some of these people I had known for a long time and they, they betrayed me and they left me for dead. And, and then I came out of nowhere and, and pulled it out and they were shocked and they didn't know how to deal with the shame themselves. Yeah. And I've nope. since forgiven, I've since forgiven all of it. it doesn't, but, but still the relationships were, were damaged. Right. And, and then what I realized is that I started to attract a different kind of friend. It wasn't that I was no longer friends with these people, and I still count them as friends, but I I look at it now for what it was. It was my journey. It was a thing I chose. And, you know, I think at that point, I started realizing that life wasn't just happening to me, but actually, paradoxically, it was actually happening for me. And I needed to look within. And, and really, to be spiritually awakened is when you realize that it's not someone else or something else or some exogenous factor that is basically impacting you and gaining control over your life. It's all a choice that we've made, every bit of it. Yeah. And so when you really go through that spiritual awakening, it turns away from judging someone else negatively and turns immediately to, why did I choose this? Hmm. Wow. What did I want to learn by having this experience? And you know, I've always believed that there are really no mistakes in life that the only mistakes are the ones that maybe we don't learn from. And therefore we have to just continue to have the same experiences over and over again in the cycles of, you know, samsara. But I, I definitely had that experience and it had a massive impact on me. Well, it's a beautiful description of what transformation really is. Transformation is different than change. You know, you can rearrange the fruit in a bowl and that's change. But if you change the entire bowl or it becomes vegetables, that, that, that's a transformation. And uh, I remember talking with Catherine Austin Fitz about a similar thing when the government went after her and dragged her through the courts for 10 years. And then she was acquitted, but they had broken her. And in the process, she not only learned who her true friends were, she learned what true friendship was. So even though she also was capable of forgiveness, uh, you found out a lot about what's trustworthy and what's not in other people's behavior. Well, when I so, met you in 2017 in Egypt, which I was really thrilled to, to meet you in person, you know, that was right at the, I would say, at the end of that period hmm. of time. And so I, I was definitely going, you know, at that moment, you know, I was going through a real spiritual transformation. I can remember having breakfast with you several times in the hotel in Cairo, and just having my mind blown by, uh, first of all, just your openness about the process that you were going through, but then about the actual process itself. And now, uh, both Walter Russell and Arthur Young were huge mentors for me, and they are each along with Nassim Haramine and Buckminster Fuller, they're what I call visionary scientists. And I would include you in that category too. And what I mean by that is, is that you're guided by visions and then you, then you do the homework to fill in the science so you can actually talk to other people about what you're seeing and then to actually uh, turn those visions into artifacts that other people can benefit from. One of the breakfasts that we had in Cairo, you told me a story about uh, a, an, an opening, a shift that you had had in uh, Hong Kong, I think it was, when you were talking with a, a, a former colleague who had been on sabbatical. Uh, could you share that story sure, of opening sure. with our audience? Sure. Yeah, I, I went to Hong Kong, and part of the job of reason I was going to Hong Kong, I was CEO of Bao Xin Lam Surgical at the time, and, and I wanted to meet with this candidate who was going to become the new country manager 
for Thailand, but had previously been the country manager for Thailand. And we had a pretty large operation in Thailand and we had 27,000 employees all around the world. And so I, I went to meet this person. I was also going to give a speech at this conference there, but I was so eager to meet this person because he had worked for us before and had left for five years and then had come back again. And the people that replaced him in the leadership structure wanted him back and were willing to subjugate themselves to his leadership again. So I thought this is such a fascinating story because you never see something like this in pharma, especially, right? It's a very cutthroat competitive environment generally. And, and so I remember going to the salad bar and seeing this guy and he'd been a Buddhist monk for five years, like literally did a five year vow of silence. And so I want to be the first to talk to him. And so I said, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and across the salad bar, I don't think we have salad bars much anymore after COVID, but, but basically I, I, I said, hi. And, and he said, hello. And, and I knew I was one of the first people to speak with him since he came back. And, and so I said, what was it like? to be on five years of vow of silence. And I said, and what did you learn? And he said, very, very stoically, there is no duality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is only oneness. Yeah, wow. And, and I was like, okay, what does that even mean? I didn't <laughs> even understand what, you know, duality necessarily was a reference to. And then why would he say there's only oneness? And, and so as I was flying home, I took out a pad of paper and I started writing down, you know, I looked up the term duality and I wanted to understand it further. And I'd heard something about it before, some strange recollection of it. And I started writing down all the things that were dualistic antonyms, right? So humility, arrogance, right? Love, fear, or possibly hatred good, evil, all these things. And I started realizing that for things like humility and arrogance, or even Democrat, Republican, or even fascist and communist, it was actually a circle. It wasn't linear. That if you take another step, anything taken to the extreme, you mm -hmm. could take humility to the extreme, and it becomes someone that actually could be perceived as being arrogant in their humility. <laughs> Right. And, and I realized that everything is more like spheroidal or at least around a circle rather than this linear line that we're perceiving. And we could see Democrat, Republican or, you know, communist, fascist, whatever. And, and then you have a difficult time differentiating between saying, OK, someone who says they're Antifa, anti-fascist, actually starts acting a lot like a fascist. Yeah. Hmm. And when you look through history, this is often the case. The things that we judge negatively in other people are the things that we actually are. Yeah. And I realized that was most true with me. The things that I was negatively judging at everyone around me were the things that I didn't like about myself. Hmm. So it was a profound moment to meet this fellow because, you know, this concept of a five-year vow of silence and, and maybe to a certain extent, I didn't do a vow of silence when I did my hermit period, but I definitely went super deep inward and I didn't talk that much. Yeah. Well, a little bit later, we'll get into some of the things that have been coming through you, some of the other things that you draw and write when you're on these airplane trips. Um, but I, I want to go, go back in history now, because you and I both share a, a passion for uh, ancient history. Mm -hmm. And I want to share my screen for a moment um, and show a few images and then ask you a little bit why uh, ancient cultures are important to you. So here's our topic for the day with the pyramids in the background and some of Robert Scribblings <laughs> laid <laughs> over that. Here's Robert in Egypt, some of the work that he's done on the geometry of the pyramid. Uh, I don't remember which, do you remember which, uh, which hallway that is, which- You know what that is? That's the, uh, that is the, I, I always love to say this because I always get stickers about it, but that's the, the shaft of Osiris. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, we just got banned on three chances. Yeah, exactly. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. But and it's then, a very deep shaft. It's about 200 feet that, wow. of ladder. And then this was from the trip that you led last year to Egypt, and I accompanied yep. mm -hmm. you uh, virtually. Uh -huh. I don't have a flyer for your 
your trip coming up. But while particularly while people are on the public platforms, mm -hmm. this is the, the the heading of the general page that you have for your in excursions, your expeditions, which are mm -hmm. phenomenal. <clears throat> um, can you uh, describe what's coming up uh, on your trip to Egypt in 2023? So in the, after we met in Egypt in 2017, I went back again by myself in 2018 in, in May. And um, the week before I went, I was uh, so excited because I, I, I had an opportunity to go to Israel for a week as well. And I was there with a group of CEOs of large companies from Southern California that I was sort of hosting. And, and we had an incredible trip across Israel and into Jerusalem. And when I was uh, in Israel that week, I kept drawing in my notebook, you know, in the bus rides and everything. I was still coming off of a little bit of this, you know, hermit sort of uh, characterization, I guess, of myself and, and my own actions. And I was drawing in my notebook all these symbols of Alpha Omega. I kept drawing Alpha Omega over and over and over again. And and I didn't really know why. And I felt like when I was going to go to Egypt after I'd been in Israel, I was going to discover something. I didn't know what it was. Well, on the night before I left Israel, I had a chance to have a dinner. It was a state dinner in uh, King Solomon's Quarry, which is uh, also known as the Cave of Zedekiah. Uh, this is where the Ark of the Covenant was known to have been hidden during uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, attack on Jerusalem. And when he took the, you know, the children of Israel at that time away into captivity to Babylon. Well, I, I jumped the rope in the fence and I wasn't allowed to do this, but there was a harpist in there. I mean, it was kind of a crazy dinner with these huge candelabras and everything in this gigantic cave. And I thought if I'm going to be in this cave and it was on the Jordanian side and no one usually gets access to it, I'm going to jump in and go deep into this cave. So I went deep into the cave. I told them I was like looking for the bathroom type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so... So I, uh, I, I, and I remember I called Nassim Haramain uh, right beforehand. I said, do you think I should go in, you know, deep into this cave? He's like, oh, absolutely. You have to yeah. find where the ark was. I mean, come on, duh. And I actually incidentally had lunch with Nassim a couple of days ago. It was great to catch up with him. Oh, good. Because, uh, you know, he's moving to France. But, but basically, I, uh, I ended up uh, going deep into the cave. And while I was deep in this cave, I was just sort of following my intuition. And, um, and I remember... Uh, casting a very long shadow inside this deep cave. And I looked down and where I was standing was an alpha omega carved into the floor. This is in the King Zedekiah's cave, right underneath the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And, and I remember looking at it and then I looked at exactly that spot and there was a mound of stone that was limestone that had all crystallized into quartz crystal. And so I filmed it all. I actually got it all on film. And I thought, this is strange that I'm seeing this Alpha Omega on the floor. Well, the next day I flew to Egypt and I had 12 people with me. And uh, while we were there, one of my friends laid in the sarcophagus because we were sort of resonating in the chamber, as you know, uh, can be done, finding that right pitch. And I knew the exact right pitch frequency to resonate the, the sarcophagus. And so I was having my friends lay in there and I was giving them this experience. And, and as I looked down, at the rim of the sarcophagus, I immediately had a memory of being in the pyramid thousands and thousands of years ago when there was an alpha omega pressed into the rose granite. And there you have a photograph of it right here. And, and I remembered being there and, and where the alpha omega was. And I looked down on the rim of the sarcophagus and exactly where I had remembered it was this writing. And I knew that you know, the Great Pyramid is not supposed to have anything on the rim of the sarcophagus. There's not supposed to be any writing there. I mean, this is very well known and much less something that might be ascribed to Greek, although I don't believe it's Greek at all. It's Atlantean. And actually, it comes before Atlantean. It's Arcturian. So I, I knew where exactly to find it. And I looked down and there it was. And and it was remarkable. And I started measuring it and everything. And then the Egyptologists came in and they were like, did you make this? And I was like, <laughs> a little graffiti on the sarcophagus. right?" Yeah, I, I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, just now. Right. I mean, I, I have my hammer and chisel. Of course, they do a body search on you before you can go into the pyramid. And it was a private night I had that night. I've spent 11 nights in the Great Pyramid now. And, uh, you know, the, the Egyptologists were like, oh, how did this get here? And they said, we've never seen this before. 
And, and, you know, I, I, obviously I looked at him, I said, well, this is dollarite. You know, it's the hardest stone. It's one of the hardest stones and most brittle stones on the planet. It's 55% quartz crystal and, and it's rose granite. And so uh, I, I said, you know, if I tried to take, or if anyone even tried to take a chisel and hammer to that edge, right, you would crack the whole thing. It would literally, you know, be so brittle, it would shatter. Hmm. And, and so, you know, they, they sort of gave up that thought because they realized they're like, wait, there's a patina over this that's as old as the sarcophagus itself. And so I knew something shifted when I saw the Alpha Omega on the rim of the sarcophagus and then later was able to do the detailed measurements on that Alpha Omega. You know, the, the room of the King's Chamber is 31.4159 meters exactly as a perimeter measurement, right? And and actually, the, the length of the Alpha Omega, the dimensions of it is exactly 5.605 inches, which comes out to be the square root of 31.4159. Exactly. So there's something to this. And then what I later realized through the work of Alan Green that the Great Pyramid had encoded all three measurement systems, the cubit, the Royal Egyptian cubit, the meter and the foot, all of which are just embedded in ratios that are inherent to basic geometry of, of hexapentacus geometry. Then I was like, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. But I knew for certain that from that mo moment forward, my life was going to be very, very different. Well, the, you know, most people on the planet think that these ancient cultures were very primitive. You know, they had copper tools, they you know, hadn't had the wheel for very long and so forth. So why why bother with ancient cultures? What do you think the importance is of the of these sites like uh, the Giza Pyramid uh, Plateau and uh, and Machu Picchu and so forth? What, what's going on that really has any importance? Well, I believe that, you know, I said it earlier that we're here to learn love and learn how to be loved. Well, in order to learn how to be loved. That means we have to start to not only truly understand who we are, but we also have to be able to truly accept who we are and all aspects of who we are. And in order to get to that stage of awareness and understanding, you, you have to be able to overcome all the biases that we create. And we look at ourselves, you know, I, I kind of think of it as we start off with like this block of cheese, right? Let's say we're this block of cheese, our personality. And then, and then we find things we don't like about ourselves. So we start cutting off the edges that we don't like. And then over life, you get to the middle of your life, you've cut so much of it off that you've separated yourself from so much of yourself mm. to basically only look back at yourself and, and perceive the narcissistic aspects that you would really like to see in yourself. If we don't see in life what we what we don't want to see. We we see only what we want to see, and so narcissism is something that happens to us because, and I think it's a portal to awakening and to enlightenment. Actually, that when we finally get past this point where we overcome our own self loathing, then we can actually embrace who we truly are. But in order to remember who we are, we have to go through this whole exercise of challenge and difficulty and experience and and basically go through tests, as it were, that we establish for ourselves. So I believe that for humanity to fully understand and be aware so that it can love and enter into a new paradigm of experience, we must also understand our past so that it can inform our future. And then gets, that gets into a retrocausal relationship because just as the past informs the future, the future also informs the past. Mm. And this is an awakening that's happening on a collective global scale that we're starting to overcome now the boundary of time and that time itself is an encryption. The, the boundary condition of the fourth dimension before you can enter into a fifth dimension of love experience is literally being able to look beyond this linear one-way street of time. Time is the encryption that keeps us inside of this paradigm. And the way that we can start to experience beyond this notional value of a linear arrow of time is to transcend duality, because time and our persistent perception of time is really just a dualistic perception. Past and future is just like a one and a zero. But mm. actually, it's more about the eternal now. And this is why this whole notion of the chi or the X in between the alpha and the omega 
right? The rational and the irrational comes into play because that introduces this concept of superposition in quantum computing, but it also introduces the concept of divine love and divinity back on earth. So I think in order for us to really be able to accept ourselves and love ourselves, we have to explore our history because that's actually who we are right now. When you start thinking about now is the only real time, mm -hmm. we have to be able to explore the history and then that will also inform our future and vice versa. Well, yeah, any, almost any mystic that I've ever talked to about my past lives has recounted to me about my past life as a healing priest in Egypt. Uh, and I have known this since I was a child. I've been obsessed with all, all things uh, pyramid and, and Egyptian. So it was like a, a high school reunion for me, you know, several thousand years later to go back with people like you and, and uh, Sam and Drew, who's on the show today, uh, to, to the sight of that. Now, you're the only person that I know uh, in recent centuries who has kind of treated the the uh, King's Chamber like an Airbnb. I, 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 I know you go and uh, sleep there occasionally. Um, and a lot of my memories are of that. Could you talk a little bit about what you think the sarcophagus and the King's Chamber are as a, as a function? Why would you bother doing that? Well, okay, I've been doing a lot of work and research on the King's Chamber in particular, um, and a lot of mathematical work on the Great Pyramid. And as I get deep into it, you know, first of all, if you look at it, the only furniture in the Great Pyramid is a sarcophagus, right? There's no other furniture there. It's this 13 acre building, right? That, you know, was the tallest building on planet Earth for over 4,000 years. If you believe that it was dynastic Egypt that built it, I, I believe it was, you know, 13,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, you know, basically, if you look at it in that context, it's like, why would they build such a gigantic pyramid? Is it a power station? What is it? And I, while I do believe that it would would able was able to generate frequency and generate energy, and now the pyramid is has been activated again. Uh, it's connected to the ley lines of Earth, and it's the throat chakra of the entire planet. Um, I believe that the primary function of the Great Pyramid is a spiritual one. It's about spiritual ascension. And anyone who has laid in the sarcophagus and experienced, and I, I mean, literally, I've taken now, you know, over 100 people into the Great Pyramid, probably 200 people, and basically had them experience uh, laying in the sarcophagus and, and resonating and the experience that they have, some of them having left their bodies, you know, in astral travel immediately uh, as you do this. And you can see this electromagnetic sort of wave going over you. I've taken several pictures of people laying in the sarcophagus and you can immediately see a rainbow arc of light, hmm. right? And you're right. I've spent many nights there. They actually gave me a key to the Great Pyramid. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, how many nights do you have to spend here to get a key to the pyramid? So, but but basically I did this analysis and, and it was actually building on the work of, of Nala Bursi uh, and Alan Green and found that the sarcophagus if you stack it on its side, could stack six times to the ceiling and five times wall to wall. So that would be the north wall to the south wall, right? And, and then if you look at the amount that it would actually fill in there, so the, the king's chamber happens to be like two cubes, right? It's slightly rectangular cubes. It's a little bit off, and I'll explain how what I mean by this. So it's it would be, you know, it's 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. So that means it's 17 point uh 17.18 feet wide and roughly 34 and a half feet right in length okay and in meters like i said that turns out to be exactly a perimeter value of 31.4159 meters now what does this mean well how many times does the sarcophagus fit into the king's chamber it fits in there 137 and a half times oh my god i never knew that wow which is the golden angle. So I'm yeah. you know, doing the measurements of volume of the sarcophagus in the King's Chamber. And if you take out the, the empty space that is occupied by the sarcophagus, then the value actually turns out to be exactly 137.036 times. That's the fine structure constant in physics, which is the most important constant in all of physics because it, it represents the Higgs boson. It represents the electron coupling constant where light is separated from darkness. 
that literally it is the threshold or the mirror of the separation between reflection and absorption of light. Mm. Uh, so it, the way it works is if you excite an electron and it goes above a threshold of 137 times, right? Then it will emit light. If it's below that, it will absorb light from an energetic perspective. So from that standpoint, I was like kind of amazed. But there's also another thing that's really important about it. If you break the king's chamber down, I've never presented on this before, but if you break the king's chamber down and you actually cut it up into what looks like Rubik's cubes, right? But slightly rectangular because the height from the floor to the ceiling is 19.098 feet and the length, right? Or the width is 17.18. So it's not exactly perfect cubes, right? It's, it's actually 10 over nine as a relationship, right? Between the two. So if it were a perfect cube, it'd be 10 to 10, right? Or one to one but it's actually 10 over nine is the ratio. And the entire Giza plateau is 11 over nine, which has big significance when we look at light speed and everything. And I, and I can talk to that if you want me to, but, but basically if you break this down into two Rubik's cube sets, that would mean you'd have nine cubes that would be smaller on each side. You're basically breaking down the room, right? Into cubic forms. And with nine and nine and nine, you then have 27 cubes for half of the room. And then you'd have 54 cubes. But then if you break those cubes down into eight smaller cubes each, that means you have 432 cubes in the king's chamber. And then this is giving us a perfect representation of three over two, the perfect fifth, and the, and the major third, which is the cube root of two. So why 432? Well, guess what? If the sarcophagus fits in the king's chamber 137 and a half times, and that were to represent a diameter of a circle, guess what the circumference of that circle would be? 432. Oh, wow. Well, let's so take the math. So the math is accomplishing something because they obviously mm -hmm. knew what they were doing. They were able to lift blocks that we can't lift today. So there was something going on there. But let's take it back to the, what you were talking about, about the spiritual function. So all of this would seem to be have to do with resonance. So uh, I... I have recollections myself and a lot of my studies, a lot of the people that I have studied believe that the sarcophagus was part of an initiation in terms of, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant apparently fits in there perfectly, but when the Ark's not there, the, 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 uh, and someone lies down in there and is resonated by the, um, by the vibrations of the Schumann resonance passing through the entire pyramid what would be the purpose of being resonated that way spiritually well first of all i think that you have to kind of look at the science behind the room to a certain extent because the speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second but the speed of sound through granite and that entire room is made of granite and rose granite is 6000 meters per second so it'd be almost like from a comparison perspective if we could speed up the speed of light, you know, uh, in the same way, we'd have to speed up the speed of light 17 and a half times. Mm. So the speed of sound is 17 and a half times faster in the Great Pyramid's King's Chamber than it is anywhere else. That seems to be kind of important, right? And, and so when you lay inside that sarcophagus, you've got these scalar waves and compression waves, longitudinal waves going through you, right, very, very rapidly. And it has some effect on your kundalini. It also has a major effect on, and that's the spiritual life force, right? That basically say, sits dormant at the base of your spine mm -hmm. until you start going through this initiation process. And actually, if you look around the king's chamber walls, there are secrets hidden within them, not only in the mathematics, but in 432, by the way, is the tetractus number. So 432 You've always probably heard of the Tetractus and the Tetragrammaton. Mm -hmm. It goes four dots, three dots, two dots, and one dot. You complete the pyramid, and four times three times two times one equals 24, right? And so 24 is the prime number pattern as well. And, and so then when you add them up, four plus three plus two plus one, it equals 10. So he's got this unique characteristic embedded already in the geometry of the room. But if you look at the petroglyphs that we've discovered on the walls, so not only have we discovered the Alpha Omega on the sarcophagus, but we also discovered 
many, many other petroglyphs all around the sarcophagus itself. There's an eye of Horus, there's an eye of Ra on exactly the same position on both sides. There's also what looks to be a uh, octachuron, which is a particular type of a geometric polytope, which looks like a almost like a bullseye on the backside, right underneath where the large crack is that's shaped like a Y. And then on the walls, um, you know, Susie discovered when we were there, a bull and a cow directly on the north wall that you can't unsee once you see it. <laughs> and that bull and cow is clearly etched into the, 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 the granite of the walls. And this represents, it's well known in Egypt, you know, Egyptology that this bull represents the Apis bull. And the name of the Great Pyramid was originally Bull Mountain. Right. So, so let me let me keep pressing you beyond the archaeology and the math to the human part of this. They built this giant thing. And if it was part of an initiation for what, what, what would a human being experience in that resonance that would be important? So the Apis bull is actually a reference to Osiris. Uh huh. OK, the cow around him is the Hathor represented by the Omega. If you've ever seen the Hathor, the Hathor has hair. It's like a cow's face, like a female cow's face with the hair that's shaped exactly like the Omega shape, right? You've seen that before. Yeah. Well, this represents Apis having to sacrifice himself or Osiris sacrificing himself to return back into oneness into his mother, right? And this is a story that is well known in Egyptology. But we go beyond this to understand that Apis and Osiris and Orion in Greek mythology are all the same reference. They're all the same person. And actually, even Zeus, this is why we have this, this thing called Serapis, right? So the Serapium, we went to the Serapium together. That's actually a name that has been ascribed to the mashing together of Osiris and Zeus into the mm. same god, right? So Serapis is that god. Also can be referred to Seraphim, which is an angelic billing, a being, an angelic being, like Metatron would be a seraphim, right? So when we look at this, what are the things that we've discovered on the walls? Well, above the bull and the cow, we discovered as well a phoenix and a Bennu bird next to each other, okay? There's also a tree of life that's on the side that the cow is facing at the towards the west side of the north wall. And then we go on the other side, and you can see a, a, basically a petroglyph of a woman on top of a deer stag with a bow and arrow shooting an arrow at a very gigantic bird. And this is representing Satet, or what we've referred to in the Greek mythology as Artemis. And Artemis was the one who fell in love with Orion, the hunter. And when she fell in love with Orion, her brother got jealous and said, oh, you're not such a great archer. You can't hit that guy swimming way, way, way in the distance. And she didn't know, or that target, she didn't know that it was Orion and she accidentally killed him. This is telling the story of her killing the boastful Orion represented by the Scorpio or the Eagle, because the Eagle is the representation anciently of Scorpio, because it goes through all these different stages, right? It goes, and it's the opposite of the bull, right? Which is the Taurus. So what's <laughs> happening here on the walls is telling us what this is all about. What does it mean for humanity? It's Orion going through his cycles of death, burial, and resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection, and many reincarnations and lifetimes to come back through this cycle to find himself. On the south wall is a water scene of death. And there's even... You know, you could see it. And for those that are interested in this, you could see some things I've posted on this, and it's going to be the subject. All these new discoveries are going to be the subject of the next installment of, of Codex on Gaia, which has become quite a popular show on, on Gaia. And, and so some of these things you'll see in that already, but the most recent stuff is going to be in the, in the next seasons. I believe that what this is doing for us, that the pyramid is actually a mirror of our consciousness that each of the chambers represents the chakras. And we know this because da Vinci also in his Vitruvian man must have had a map because he drew horizontal lines on the Vitruvian man that were matching exactly the positions of each of the chambers, right? When you overlay it exactly and the exact angle that he used, the reference point being from the center of the navel of Vitruvian man to the upper corner of the square turns out to be precisely the same slope angle of the Great Pyramid. 
And that's something we discovered a few years ago. And what I believe this is saying to us is that as we go through the initiation process and we awaken, that each of these chambers within us become awakened and then they become more visible. This is also why we're now seeing that the most recent ground penetrating radar technology, which is called optical coherence tomography, is discovering many, many new chambers inside the Great Pyramid. And that we as humanity are starting to unlock these hidden chambers within ourselves as we ascend, right? So I believe that the whole purpose of the Great Pyramid is to act as a mirror of our consciousness, to realize that we've been going through these cycles of samsara, to realize that Osiris is just a metaphor for mankind and Orion is a metaphor for mankind going through this cycle of reincarnation, death, and resurrection, and then finally facing west, coming home to end the cycle of samsara and break this endless cycle, which it seems like it's been endless, of learning to remember who we are and to learn how to love and to accept ourselves just as we are. And that mm -hmm. is our realization of, div of divine of divine love. You know, that, that is our God realization. Well, that's beautifully said. Wow. Let me pause you there for a moment because we're going to need to um, to close the public platform soon and, and invite people over to, uh, if they're not already part of the Freedom Portal, to they, you can do a, a free trial and come right back in and join the show. We'll show you that in just a minute. But while, while the rest of the people are still on, um, the would you talk a little bit about where people uh, should find information about uh, the, uh, the ancient culture trips that you do and specifically the Egypt trip in February? Sure, sure. Um, if they go to robertedwardgrant.com, you can find pretty much everything on all of this work there. Um, and also, we do do trips. Uh, this will be my last trip to Egypt for quite some time uh, because I'm now feeling like I'm being called to kind of go back to some of these other ancient sites, including uh, Jerusalem and across uh, Israel and Jordan and Petra. Uh, that'll be our next trip. And then the next trip after that is going to be to uh, Gobekli Tepe and Turkey. And I just can't do that many trips because I have, sure. you know, other things I have to do in life as well. But uh, this will be the last trip to Egypt for a while. So if you want to attend, you can also attend via the virtual pass like you had uh, on our last trip because you wanted to stay up in what's happening with the latest uh, uh, discoveries. We discovered over 200 new uh, petroglyphs while we were in Egypt on this last expedition in 2021. And I expect we're going to discover it as, as you know many, many more. One of them was a gigantic Alpha Chi Omega on the walls of the uh, Osirian, which is an Abydos temple. So I was wearing the day we discovered it, and I wasn't even the one who discovered it. It was the group who discovered it. And the whole thing got captured on film. And they're like, Robert, there's an Alpha Chi Omega on the wall over there. And, and I'm looking at it, and you can see the back of my T-shirt, which said Alpha Chi Omega on it, which was kind of trippy, right? We, wow. we live in a a virtual simulation that is of our own making that we set up so that we can have these experiences to learn love. And it's a beautiful thing. And, and the game of life feels pretty hellish until you figure out that it is a game that we wanted to experience. Yeah. Now, I really want to encourage people that this isn't just some tourist trip to Egypt. Uh, he, he, Robert calls it an expedition on purpose. You are there with him discovering and, and connecting dots that have never been. And so I strongly encourage you go with him if you can, at least virtually, uh, and sign up for that, you know, while there's still room. So when we come back and I guarantee you, we are just getting started. This was just part one. So um, what, where's the, where's the website that people could go to if they want to, cause I'll, I'm going to have to sign off here on the Instagram portion of this well as well. So where do they go to? So uh, Leandro, would you come on or Drew come on to say that? We're going to be posting it in the chat as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to be back here in the, the Freedom Portal as always um, to just be a part of this epic conversation. Trust me, these guys are just getting warmed <laughs> up. So um, for anybody who's on the public platforms that wants to um, join us for the rest of the conversation in Zoom with our community, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how to do that. So... So you're, you're first going to go to thriveone.com and then come down to click start trial. 
And that's going to take you to the page where you can select uh, your your level, whether you want to be an explorer or an angel, and um, your time period, whether you want to be billed uh, monthly or annually. And uh, once you click start trial, um, of course, we're going to need your card like uh, any subscription, uh, but it's a free trial. If for whatever reason you decide that you don't want to continue to be a part of our community, um, you can cancel at any time, but I'm certain you're going to want to stay um, once you see the both the quantity and the quality of these epic conversations that we have in the portal. So um, you'll be taken to the thank you page after that, and you can click return to the Freedom Portal catalog. So it's just thriveon.com is where yep. they go. Thrive on. Thrive on. So T H R I V E O N dot com. Absolutely. Perfect. And uh, we'll, we'll be po pasting that in the chat uh, everywhere where we have, um, you know, the public platforms. So um, you'll be taken back to uh, the event page where you can, uh, you're going to want to click sign in to continue, not the get access now because you've already uh, signed up. So go to sign in to continue. Um, enter the credentials you just set up with us. And it'll take you back to um, today's event where you can click attend. And then it'll um, give you a link to join webinar. And uh, once you click that, you'll be here with us in the community um, in Zoom and able to get a part, uh, be a part of the rest of the conversation and um, the Q&A and all that, which you definitely don't want to miss. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys for joining us and hope to see you soon. And before we close down those platforms, let me give you a, a preview of what's coming up, because we've just done uh, a little touch into the importance of ancient cultures. And ancient, the part of the ancient cultures, obviously, is the cosmic patterning that is revealed when you understand how they're building, the stories that they tell, and so forth. So we're going to go talk a little bit about that patterning, because Robert is really an expert and an ongoing source of realization of that cosmic patterning. And then once we get our feet wet in the patterning, then we're going to take it into the applications in modern technology. We're going to talk about the, the companies that Robert has with you know teams of mathematicians and engineers who are taking this esoteric knowledge and putting it into absolutely critical and empowering technology, not to control the world, but to actually set everybody free, honoring individual sovereignty uh, and the privacy of, of our data. And then we're just gonna be looking at uh, the various solutions that all of this leads to. So uh, we truly, if you have the time, jump over and get a free trial. I, our our conversion rate for people who try is running about 87%. You know, this isn't just some sale. <laughs> this is absolutely critical information to the future of humanity. So we hope that you become a part of it. It's a fantastic uh, community. Okay.